All right, hi, Ferry. So, the story goes that about a month ago, when former President Trump's Twitter was taken down, Finally, somebody got the phrase 1984 was here is trending. And ever since then, I haven't been able to get that out of my head. The fact that a fictional story was trending. And on that day, that book kind of sparked this huge political debate about censorship and all these other themes. I thought to myself, why does everyone know exactly what 1984 is? And I kind of realized, English class. I have the mind of a mastermind. For those of you that don't know, 1984 is a dystopian fiction novel that a lot of people in high school here in the U.S. had to read. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second, but I kind of realized it's not only 1984, it's also Fahrenheit 451, Animal Farm, all these other dystopian fiction novels. It seems that here in the U.S., high school English is highly politicized, even though we do have classes dedicated towards U.S. government and U.S. history. And not only that, because in my experience, I'm class of 2018, by the way, a lot of discussions, writing prompts, essay prompts, a lot of that kind of stuff in high school English will be very heavily politically focused. Why is that exactly? Why is a class that's just supposed to teach you proper grammar, essay structure, all that, why is it so heavily political? What about these classes curriculums spurs such political discussion and has such a strong impact on people that they bring it up years and years and years after they graduated? Potentially it's because U.S. history and U.S. government, those classes are very fact-based, like everything has to be fact-checked. It's based in fact, reality, history. But in English class, you can be exposed to works of fiction things that never happened and things that may never happen. And then reflecting on my own experience as well as just talking to my sisters about it, high school English is one of those environments in high school where you can be analyzing works of theoretical fiction and somehow have morals or lessons extracted, yet still process that material in a way or in an analysis as if the story you're being told was of high importance. You're kind of conditioned to think that everything you read in English class has some kind of moral or message that it's trying to teach you. It isn't just trying to teach you the difference between their and there or how punctuation works. There's always something there that's meant to impact you in a way, to influence you in a way, a moral or a lesson. And judging by the way that people bring up these high school English classics, if you will, in a lot of political discussions, I think it's very safe to say that these actually have a long-lasting impact on people, debatably more so than the things they learn in U.S. government and U.S. history. Works of fiction continue to shape people's perspective on politics. I'm pretty sure a lot of other people that have had similar high school experiences to me, you had to read a lot of books written in the Orwellian style. That basically means books that are either written by George Orwell or feature similar themes as Orwell's books. All of these involve some kind of tyrannical power or the corrupting nature of power. But the thing that makes Orwellian Orwellian is not necessarily the issue of censorship. In fact, Sparknotes kind of, Sparknotes got a little bit shady on Twitter. Period Peach! over the assumption that Orwellian just means censorship, because yes, censorship is a huge part of the of the dystopias Orwell creates. However, this isn't a book report. This will come in handy later, trust me. The main concept in these Orwellian dystopias is the way language is altered and changed. Certain key words of language have their meaning distorted or perverted in a strange way. Like the Ministry of Love is actually the Ministry of Torture. The Ministry of Truth is actually the Ministry of Lies and Propaganda. The Ministry of Peace is the Ministry of War. Or Orwell's thing was not censorship, it was actually introversion of language. It was a description of theoretical ways that people in power can take advantage of people, uninformed people with short attention spans, and employ various tactics to completely break down their critical thinking. You can see this in the concept of double think. Basically, when a person knows something isn't true, or knows something isn't the correct meaning, but they accept it anyway. Similar in a way to the phrase alternative facts. Alternative facts. Alternative facts. Alternative facts. I hate this channel. Imagine how tired we are of it. I honestly think the comparison of 1984 to what happened in that situation wasn't necessarily incorrect, but it was one that displays an almost cruel kind of self-awareness in a way. As I said before, one of the core concepts of 1984 is the distortion of language. That concept that all it takes is to change a few words in a sentence, and that's the difference between having people believe you and place faith in you or know that you're completely lying. Another concept that ties into that is something called the burden of proof. Basically, if you have a claim or if you say something, it is not the other person's job to disprove your claim that you have not proven yet. A real world example of this happening is Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, oh, no. her saying that the California wildfires were caused by Jewish space lasers. As stupid as that sounds, it's not my job or people listening to her, it's not their job to disprove a claim that she has not yet proven. Obviously that's an incredibly stupid example because I'm pretty sure we all know that 
it shit ain't adding up. But this kind of logic can actually be a lot more deceptive than you think. People not knowing how to verify the legitimacy of claims and understand the underlying meaning of language. That can have very serious consequences because even though I'm pretty sure we're all smart enough to know that wildfires aren't caused by space lasers, there are a lot more things that can deceive you. For example, the claims that, oh, the coronavirus was just something invented by our political adversaries, or perhaps drawing on a map to alter the path of a hurricane. And those aren't lies, those are just alternative facts. Do you see how dangerous that can be? Those things I said to you clearly knowing that they're lies, these unproven claims that have no legitimacy. By me replacing one word in my sentence, replacing lies with alternative facts, you have a situation where if someone did not have the attention span to check the validity of my statements, they may actually believe me. And that ties into another very important concept in Orwellian societies, and that is when the truth becomes something subjective. Through complacency, Big Brother has achieved a society that can be spoon-fed lies and be told it's the truth, and even though some people may still have the common sense to look at something and say that it doesn't make sense, that doesn't matter, because Big Brother is the only trusted source of information. And any time a mistake is made on Big Brother's part, he'll blame it on his political adversaries or political outsiders, thus distancing himself from the blame, making him seem almost perfect, and he does that by a distortion of the very meaning of the word truth. And then you have the Orwellian concept, or at least the concept within 1984, of the two-minute hate. The political adversaries of Big Brother are are basically put on a screen while commentary plays about their very shortcomings in the audience. The audience just has this huge adverse reaction where they're getting up screaming, you know, rejecting this ideology. They have an extremely inflammatory response to any opposition. An extremely inflammatory response, a hate-fueled response to opposing media. The comparison is definitely there. Now come on now! I don't want to say that they misunderstood 1984 by bringing it up. In fact, I want to say they understood the impact it's had on many people. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew that so many people bear such a strong connection to that book because they were exposed to it at such a young age, debatably being brainwashed by this work of theoretical fiction that from a young age they had to look at and say, these are the morals, this is what I've learned from the book, this is, this is what I'm taking away from this reading experience or whatever. And English teachers can actually get away with influencing people even further. They can get away with nudging students in a certain direction. Because like all of us, English teachers can have their own political biases, and these can impact the way they teach and what they focus on. Because the thing is, 1984 does not depict a society that is more to the left or the right. It is simply Big Brother. So if someone were to compare a political party to 1984 without actually backing up that claim and fully articulating the reason why they're doing that, that potentially exposes a bias on their part. When you read 1984, for in high school? Did your English teacher make it feel more like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany? That's the big question. The way the American education system is set up gives a valuable opportunity to politically influence a lot of people. You have multiple books in the curriculum that spawn multiple different political discussions which can be influenced a certain way. It can be taken in any direction you want and that direction can be influenced by political biases of English teachers. English teachers can have their own political opinions, that's perfectly fine, but I want to say it's not really an English teacher's fault if their student volunteers voluntarily blackpills themselves when you tell them to read a George Orwell book. That's not really, that's not really their fault. And there was actually an article I was reading where they interviewed students about the way specifically English class impacts their political beliefs, and I found a very interesting, a very interesting passage that was written by a student. Insert the thing here, insert the voice clip or whatever. Okay. I had two teachers who we will call Miss A and Miss B who were both about the same in terms of their political alignment. Miss A was completely forthcoming about her position in terms of politics and was willing to civilly discuss this with those who disagreed with her. Miss B never did disclose her political leanings, but through her attempts to influence students, it was clear how she felt. Miss A was commonly respected even by those who disagreed with her completely. Miss B was commonly disliked for her attempts to subtly influence our opinions and never being truthful. Teachers often feel that they are protecting their students by ensuring that their political leanings are kept a secret. In reality, by not being truthful about any potential biases that the teacher might have, they are leaving their students wide open to be indoctrinated through subtle tactics and ideological influence. Not to blatantly say, but to imply, but you would also be trying to influence their real-world political beliefs off of a fictional story. That would be doing them a disservice. It's important to remember that the world of 1984 is not the real world. It is not something based 
based in fact, it's a work of fiction. However, it can still have a huge impact on people's political beliefs as we've seen. And I know I keep talking about 1984, but it's not only that one, it's also other works like Fahrenheit 451, Lord of the Flies, all of these works have a very specific purpose. And that purpose is to groom students to be the next generation of leaders. Because you can learn all you want about the Senate, government, US history, but it doesn't change the fact that the mind does extremely well with theoretical concepts. By exposing you to the antithesis of democracy, authoritarianism, if you will. Those stories are useful to remember, not when debating policy or politics, but when debating concepts and conceptual issues. I don't feel as if they politically influence you by giving the answer, like other classes may do. They influence you by starting a discussion, a political discussion, and that discussion could be influenced by a moderator or a teacher. It's actually quite interesting to think about how our public education system influences us in that way, right under a lot of people's noses. Interesting. And I can imagine that in certain communities, there can be larger amounts of people that bear a certain political bias and can dominate discussions, thus creating a situation where it would be highly likely to influence a neutral individual to one side. As they aren't really discussing politics or policy, but more so concepts, the core concepts that determine an individual's political identity. The way you discuss these novels can actually impact your political beliefs, not directly, but indirectly through discussions of morality, fear, power, discussions of all the like, I have to go. Ethan Winters is here. You'll have to excuse my hasty exit, but nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, feel free to subscribe and go ahead and leave a comment for the algorithm. It really does help, but I will hopefully see you in the next one. Bye. Mommy Milkies.